Good afternoon. On behalf of the ISSA Canada team and our show partners, Media Edge Publishing and the International Facility Managers Association, welcome and thank you for attending our virtual event. I'm Mike Nosco, Executive Director of ISSA Canada. And before we begin, I would like to share a few things with you about today's program. Our group has worked very hard over the past months to provide content that is a benefit to all our market segments. A special thanks to our presenters who will share their knowledge about emerging trends and what to expect in the new normal as we move forward in a post-pandemic world. This virtual event is being put together in a straightforward and convenient fashion for all our attendees. Just keep your screens open and the sessions will continue for the duration. I hope you will stay with us and don't forget to join us at the conclusion for our virtual networking event. It has been a challenging time over the past 16 months and much attention has been brought to our industry and what it represents. Never before has the value of clean been so important in keeping our facilities, workers and general public safe and healthy. You all deserve a tremendous amount of credit and you should be very proud of your contribution in the war on COVID-19. ISSA is leading the world when it comes to advancing clean and bringing education, accreditation and industry standards to the forefront. We urge people and organizations to hop on board and get involved to help us raise the bar in the cleaning industry. I want to stress again how important the contribution has been from our frontline workers, our manufacturers, and our supply chain. You have all answered the bell. You have gone beyond what's been expected. And guess what? The world is taking notice. There's been a lot of suffering and many lives lost in the COVID-19 war. Our sympathies and deepest sorrows go out to all those who have been affected. Before we begin our first session, we would like to thank our sponsors who have helped make this virtual event possible. Our platinum sponsors, Clorox Pro and Scandinavian Building Services. Our gold sponsors, Charlotte Products, Ilfis Canada, Rubbermaid Commercial Products, SC Johnson Professional, and Zytec Germbuster. Our silver sponsors, International Power Systems, Candroid Robotics, and Swish Maintenance, experts in complete cleaning solutions. We will be sending you a link of today's ISSA Canada's virtual experience recording for you to share with your staff or industry colleagues within a few days. I would like to turn things over to one of our platinum sponsors, Candace Elford, Vice President of Procurement with Scandinavian Building Services. Candace? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Candace Elford, and I'm the Vice President for Procurement and Risk Management at Scandinavian Building Services. Scandinavian is very proud to support the ISSA Canada Show 2021 as a platinum level sponsor this year. Our organization has recognized significant opportunities in Canada, and we sincerely look forward to speaking and working with Canadian professionals. A little background about us. Scandinavian Building Services is a national janitorial company serving customers from coast to coast. Our team of 7,000 plus cleaning professionals are responsible for putting the shine on 150 million square foot of retail and commercial properties daily. Our clients include Canada's largest national retailers like TJX and Walmart, commercial spaces from small offices to large towers, iconic sports and entertainment facilities like Rogers Place and Bell MTS Centre. Industrial spaces, global property management companies like CBRE and BGIS. We also include fitness facilities, shopping centers, and much more. No cleaning challenge is too big or too small for Scandinavian building services. We've even created a special services division within our company to help our customers limit the number of vendors they require. We strive to be the one-stop shop for services like specialty floor care, pandemic disinfecting, pressure washing, parking lot maintenance, litter pickup, construction cleanup, and so much more. Having been in the industry for over 65 years, we understand what goes into the complete management of a cleaning program for all business types and sizes. It is my pleasure to introduce today's ISSA Canada opening keynote session, which is a roundtable discussion entitled, 
optimizing B2B sales models and strategies, how distributors can and must accelerate post-pandemic. Today's roundtable participants are Tom Gale, who is CEO of Gale Media, a market research and media company that provides market intelligence products and services to wholesale distribution executives through its two brands, Modern Distribution Management and MDM Analytics. Since 1967, MDM has been the definitive resource for distribution management, best practices, competitive intelligence, and market trends through its market analytics, consulting, and market research, newsletters, books, and events. Gail has written and edited several books, including Stand Out from the Competition, Four Pathways to Different Your Wholesale Distribution Company, published by the National Association of Wholesale Distributors. He is also the executive editor of MDM's Distributor's Guide to Analytics. Tom Fournier is long associated with the cleaning industry in Canada and has been a strong advocate of ISSA Canada. For the past three years, he has been working with B2B clients on sales strategies and sales models through his company, The Shades Mills Group. Prior to that, he worked 30 plus years for one of Canada's foremost suppliers of washroom tissue, towel and skincare products, with many of those years in the role of national sales manager. On behalf of today's panel and the entire team at Scandinavian, we hope you enjoy today's keynote session. We also hope you enjoy all of the great session content that the ISSA Canada show delivered today. After the closing keynote has concluded, please join us for the ISSA Canada show virtual networking reception and make sure to visit us at our table to say hello. After the opening keynote has concluded, please join us for the next session, Electrostatic Technology, a new method of surface. Thank you again for being with us and please to enjoy today's keynote session. Over to you, Tom and Tom. Well, it's a real pleasure for me to be sitting here with, with Tom Gale uh, and sharing the, this forum. I've watched so much of his online content and, and really enjoy it. And I'm really pleased to bring Tom in, here and share him with this Canadian audience. So time's brief. We're going to dive right in. If you have questions, please enter them into the Q&A as you think of them. And, and then we'll have a little bit of time after the presentation to address those. So Tom, you focused your career on distribution and using that perspective, can you tell us why the role of distribution within the supply chain in the cleaning and hygiene industry is so important? Well, Tom, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. And um, you, we have many uh, ISSA members, uh, both in the US and Canada who are our customers and um, some very good friends as well. So it's really a pleasure to be spending some time with you today. Uh, the, the, key, the key piece here, I think, is that um, this has been what I've learned over the last 30 years is, is the North American distribution ecosystem, if you will, is the most flexible and fluid in the world. And it's, it's the most adaptable. And you know, going back to the 2008, 2009, uh, great recession, but even more so in the past uh, 18 months the testing of the resiliency of uh, supply chain has never been greater. And, and I think what we've seen, and I know we'll be talking a little bit today, is, is just how resilient and how powerful it has been. Excellent. Well, what impact has the pandemic had on the overall business health of distribution? You know, that's a, that, that is a hugely, um, faceted question, really, when you take a look at it. There's so many angles to that. Uh, bottom line, I think what it's really done is to um, cause all of us personally to really look hard at what's important to us. And I would say in the same sense uh, for business leaders, it's done the same thing. So I know in my conversations over the last year and, and a lot of the research that we've been focused on has been really around how how have companies made that pivot as quickly as possible from survival mode to much more of a future focus? And, and most importantly, it's been so difficult to get teams to, um, to really align and, and to face forward. So that's been a lot of the challenge, I think, is really for 
leaders in, in supply chain and, and across all industry sectors is how do you motivate, how do you align your teams, and how do you get them excited about what the future looks like? All of this when you can't be doing face-to-face -face meetings, the sales model, which has been critical in terms of face-to-face -face meetings, all of a sudden that shuts down overnight. How do you how do you flip? We're all extremely exhausted by Zoom meetings, but we've learned to adapt. And um, I know we're going to talk a little bit more. We've done some research most recently. I'm excited to share in terms of how customers have shifted and what they're looking for. Well. Let's talk first about distribution. What changes have they faced or what adaptations have they had to implement? The, the biggest thing I think really is how to connect and engage customers. This isn't something that's, that's new. Um, you know, if you take a look at the arc of how uh, the industry's evolved here, particularly over the last 10 years, certainly digital has had a huge impact and immediately impacted. Um, but take a look at, at Amazon, Amazon Business, and, and what that's developed over the last 10 years and the impacts that had, has had across all industry sectors. Uh, and I think what we've seen, particularly in the last 18 months, 15 months, it's just accelerated. I, I read one place, it's accelerated by three to five years, a lot of the industry trends that were going on. So I, I think first and foremost was the core sales model in terms of how distributors engage their customers and how customers wanted to be served by their distributors as well. And I think what you've really seen is that distributors have really started to look at how can we use some of the technology things that can make us easier to do business with. We're not going to compete with Amazon business. You, you can't out-compete them on what they market and sort of that digital self-service but you can get close enough where you can create a great experience for your customers who value those other types of services and product portfolio that they're not going to get that kind of consultative. Um, they're not going to get that online. It's, it's, it's that personal knowledge, the knowledge of the challenges. It's the workflow. There's so many other qualities outside of the pure product that distributors can differentiate on. I think what's really happened in the last uh, year has it's really forced distributors to take a hard look at that and really start to build out some strategies over what the future success for them is going to look like. So we have pandemic inspired acceleration of, of trends. We, we have changes and adaptations. How many of, of those shifts are going to become the new reality for distribution going forward? You know, I, uh, this comes back to my ability to guess the future. So I, you know, I've, I've never, I've never, if, if I could do that better, um, I, I'd be off on an island somewhere, probably in, uh, in, in, a, in a warm climate. Um, I, I really believe that it's going to be a mix. Um, and it goes to what I said before. I, I think this is a, a great opportunity for distributors to identify what they're best at in terms of the customers that they serve, the segments that they serve best, and their real expertise in terms of those personal relationships. A lot of people have said, oh, you know, we're going to be just Zooming the rest of our lives and, and you know, customers don't want to see a salesperson. We've just completed research of more than 1,500 customers, and it's across all segments. Um, and, and it includes some, uh, actually one of the distributor part participants was a U.S. Uh, member of ISSA. And what we've discovered is that there are certain things that customers want to do online and digitally. And that is you know, checking inventory, um, having some better visibility in terms of what uh, you know, product availability looks like. Um, but even things like paying invoices and automating some of those things. Um, but very much there, we got an overwhelming response about the importance of the personal relationships and the visits. And it's, it's not around the donuts that you hear everybody talking about delivering. That's not, that, that's long gone. It's, it's all about the knowledge of the customer's business, the challenges that they face, and the unique ways that the distributor can serve those needs of the customer. 
everybody's been shocked. Every business has been shocked. The distributors that, that we've seen that are most successful, they have really figured out how to get closer to their customers and really come in at a time of crisis and need and fill some big gaps in terms of when people, um, you know, some companies had to let people and staff go. They, they lost a, a, a certain amount of talent and certainly all of their workflows just kind of went out the window in terms of what normal operating procedure was. A lot of distributors were able to come in and give a lot of stability and support right away. And what's been interesting that, that we found in terms of specifically for the cleaning and hygiene industry is that there was absolutely um, you know, shortages immediately you know, across the different sectors and PPE and, and different product categories. What we found was that immediately the really successful distributors started to triage their customer segments and they identified, and of course, you know, the health, uh, you know, and, and kind of human services customers absolutely were at the top of the list for their needs in terms of serving all, all, the, all the fallout and, and all the critical needs that the pandemic created. Um, and then secondly, they just figured out on a case by case basis, sort of who was going to get product first. But the key piece of this is that they immediately communicated and were very clear in their communication across all those segments of their customers. So, and, and that brings us to, again, taking a look at the future. I think it's forced a lot of distributors to take a look at how they segment, how they use data and how they take a look at making analytics and data much more a day-to-day -day aspect of how they run their businesses going forward. All right. Uh, when I look at future forecasting, I've been known to have a, a magic eight ball in meetings, and then I find that's as good a tool as anything. <laughs> so, uh, the, the next couple of questions, I, I'm going to kind of blend, you know, so, it, you know, the U.S. is a little bit ahead of us, but, we, you know, we can start to see the light at the end of the tunnel. We're coming out of the pandemic. You know, what should distributors be preparing for in near future? And then what does the next three to five years hold for them? Yeah. Well, I mean, just as a preview, um, you, you know, we're, we're in the beginning of summer here and it was about a month ago that really a lot of the masks in the individual states, uh, I'm in Colorado and one of the uh, Colorado opened up. I can tell you immediately the Monday after the weekend that the governor here made that announcement, rush hour was back for the first time in, in 15 months. And, um, it's now, um, it's, you know, the airport here is, sort of back to pre-pandemic levels. I would say a lot of the traffic, people are going back to offices. So actually a lot of the you know, shutdown that took place in terms of institutionally need for their ongoing uh, needs as, as, as far as cleaning and hygiene, uh, all of those are absolutely ramping up here. So I, you know, we're forecasting and everybody's really forecasting here a really quick ramp up um, and, and every, all the, all the indicators, economic indicators are extremely positive. So I'm sure that's going to start to kick in and, and have an impact for Canada as well here. I think the key thing, and, and this is the, this is perennial been, been when you go into these types of, of cycles, um, there's a bullwhip effect in terms of supply and demand and availability of product. And, and I, I think those distributors that have the strongest relationships with their suppliers uh, and the open communication are going to be best positioned to make sure that they're they do have the inventory, they have the information, so that they can support their customers and that there's no surprise. And, and I think that's one of the key differentiators here, Tom, is really that um, for customers, there's never been more availability for sourcing products. You know, if if if, if they go to one distributor, they don't have it, they can get on their keyboards and go look for it really quickly. So. What I said before about moving forward, it's just the pandemic has really just accelerated that need for distributors to carefully segment their customers, identify the most profitable ones and the ones where they're going to be most successful in terms of enabling their customer success and, and that will fuel their growth as well. All right, you referenced this a little bit earlier, but uh, an emerging force in the B2B world is Amazon business. How can a distributor differentiate itself and preserve its customer base from the onslaught of Amazon? Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, that's been the the 
thousand pound gorilla out there, right? And and they they one by one gone to different segments and and commoditized them. Um, but obviously they they they've gone from just a few years ago uh, they announced their revenues at 10 billion to the, most recently that they finished up 2020 at 25 billion dollar run rate. Now that I. I'd like to put that in context, and I would I would like to tame the beast because it's I think it's been I think we've given them more power than they really deserve because they they offer a relatively limited set of services and absolutely you know in terms of price availability logistics they're unbeatable often but I think there's strategies that every company can take to compete against their value proposition. And by that, I mean, if, if you take a look at that 25 billion, um, and, and for context, we, we map out the total sort of MRO markets, the maintenance, repair, operating, including uh, Jan San cleaning and hygiene products. You know, you can, you can profile it, but for the US alone, probably 600 to $800 billion range. So Amazon has $25 billion of that. That's a big chunk, but still in the overall scheme of things, take a look at how fragmented their product categories are, are as well. So you start to take that down into smaller chunks. Absolutely, they're going to own a piece of the market. And so I think what's important is for distributors to take a look and say, what are the pieces of the market that are opportunities for us and where we're going to be successful going forward? And, and I think they can, I think there's huge amounts of opportunity opening up and that the pandemic has actually presented in terms of the needs and changing needs of customers, not just digitally, but in terms of the pivots that they're making and the type of customization that distributors can bring in there because they do have those personal relationships and the trust and integrity. You know, Amazon has the, the integrity factor that they have has been around reliability for logistics and that. But if you take a look at the rest of it, you know, there's not a lot of feel good at any level. Um, you know, whether you know you take a look at all the government actions that are going on, there's a lot of labor issues with Amazon now. It's it's it, it they've got a lot of threats and risk there as well. So I, I'm I'm not discounting the impact and and the you know, the, the negative impacts that it's had on traditional models of distribution. I think what it's done is forced a lot of people to really take a hard look at what's made them successful to this point and then really take a harder look at what are the things we need to change and what can we do to, to fight that, but really proactively build a much stronger company out of it. Excellent. Uh, when I look at, at trends in the U.S., I see companies like Imperial Date, Brady Industries, you know, with the backing of equity companies, seemingly buying up all of the independent distributors. Uh, I've just seen a, a notice recently for yet another Imperial Date acquisition. Uh, can we expect to see similar in Canada? I, I would believe so. I mean, it, to me, it's in, you know, in the 30 years I've been studying uh, wholesale distribution channels across North America, it, it's incredibly fragmented um, industry. And across product sectors, uh, started to join together some, but also in terms of customer segments and, and served. Um, you know, in this arena, you look at the industrial part of the market, you look at particular companies that have focused on food service, disposables, bags, things like that. Um, and then, I mean, look at the paper and the industrial side as well as the, the other sides. And, and all of this is coming together and you're seeing a, a lot of this merging together. Um, you know, NW Synergy and what's taking place with that in terms of bringing a lot of this together. Um, I, I absolutely believe that the, it's going to be crossing borders. There's so much money out there in terms of uh, private equity money but also just from a strategic uh, standpoint, I, I believe there's a lot of opportunities to, to gain some of those synergies and strengthen. Um, the, the most successful models and that I've seen um, it have been those um, acquirers and consolidators that have essentially left the frontline companies operate um, in, and maintain the relationships that got them 
to where they were and successful because I've seen instances in other industries where consolidators have come in and basically kind of stripped out all of the um, kind of overhead or expense and at some point and that takes a look at some of the, probably the some of the salespeople with the most experience and knowledge and, and also some of the uh, management talent that has the most knowledge about the nuances around specific markets. That's what I've seen is a lot of these consolidators come in and they've been successful in areas outside of distribution and they kind of try to bring a cookie cutter approach to this. It, every instance of that, it fails. You can't do that. There, there are nuances in wholesale distribution, the relationship, and very specific markets based on the DNA of the customer bases that are in there and in individual customers. You can't cookie cutter a lot of this. It's a complex, this B2B markets um, are very complex and, and you have, it, it really requires a lot of skill to manage effectively. Great, thanks. Uh, we've got a couple moments left. Uh, why don't we take a, a moment to talk about modern distribution management? Uh, how can you help distributors, manufacturers, and their customers as we look to the future? Yeah, well, thank you, Tom. I, um, you know, it's it's really along the lines of what we've talked about. I mean, we're we're a um, you know, we describe ourselves as both a market research but a, a niche media company in that we've we've been around since 1967. Uh, and, and I've been the steward of it since 1992 when I had the opportunity to buy it. Um, we really focus on the core pillars of what makes for successful distribution, and that's, that's around the, the technology side of things, um, around data and analytics. Uh, that's a huge component in terms of the, what differentiates distributors from their competitors. Um, talent is another one of the pillars that we focus on as far as uh, what makes for successful distributors. And the final piece is really around process uh, and process discipline. This goes back more than 20 years ago when I did research with a, another uh, consultant in the industry here in the U.S. with a lot of deep background in the industry. And we put together a book with 10 case studies specifically around how do you differentiate your distribution company. And we identified those pillars as well as a number of other attributes that really make for successful distribution company. So our research is really focused around all of that. So that's why when I talk about what's going to be successful going forward, some things don't change. You know, there's there's the whole, obviously the world has gone upside down for many people, but those core areas and the way that distributor leaders can leverage those pillars of the talent that they have. And in many cases today, going forward, you need new type of talent on board, those who are more digital savvy, more analytic, analytic and data driven. Uh, that's, the, that's the next generation you know, coming in. So that's a huge component. The other pieces that I mentioned are well. All, all of those are really critical aspects, I think, going forward and, and why I'm excited. I, I think there's a huge amount of opportunity uh, out of all the chaos and, and what distributors have navigated to get to today. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity, particularly in these next 12 to 24 months here. Well, I'm a proud subscriber and I'd highly recommend to others to, to have a look and, and, and consider doing the same. I, I think you guys do a great job and it's a, a tremendous resource. So thank you for this, Tom. Uh, I think at this point we will turn to the questions out there. We'll, we'll address some of the ones that have been entered already and then uh, we have a few moments for people to enter in some, some new questions. So let's go. Sounds great. Thank you. All right. I was waiting for my co-pilot to show up there. Um, uh, let's dive into a couple quick ones here. Uh, first, uh, Ken Bond was asking uh, what benefits ISSA to a new commercial janitorial company. I, I think the answer maybe best comes from Mike Nosco or, or someone at ISSA, but, but I think you'll find that, that it's just a tremendous resource and probably a the greatest value will be um, a lot of the training courses and technical support there. So uh, I hope someone there will uh, uh, 
you know, answer you in greater detail. Also, I, I want to recognize Shannon Hall from Dustbane, who posted on LinkedIn the, the Magic 8 Ball and, and dredged that out of my memories, and that's why he showed up here. Uh, and then, Tom, uh, we have a question from Colin Halligan from Karsher Canada, and he talks about, uh, you know, wondering if distributors are going to get more focused on what they're good at and then maybe uh, moving to more of a singular or dual product offering. So, so get more focused on, on what they're selling and, and representing in the marketplace. Yeah, I, I, I love that question, Tom, because it's this is I, I do believe that we will be seeing that. And, and a lot of what we've been talking about in terms of the impacts and what the last year and a half has really done is forced um, all companies really to take a look at their cost to serve customers and what that looks like. So if you, and, and, and obviously Amazon business has taken out some of that high margin sort of, uh, you know, some of the, some of the commodities that customers used to bundle in. And that was a pretty good um, sort of chunk of the business. And I, I know in other sectors, certain sectors, some of that was like, could be 10%, 20%, of, of a core business, but it was very high margin business. With Amazon business and other marketplaces, other digital competitors now coming in and, and taking some of that, I, I think distributors have to really take a look at how many how many lines they're 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 representing. I, I think it really comes down to having picking your partners and who you're going to go to market with, who is really going to be able to support you and what the efforts are. Um, I, I, I know a lot of great examples of manufacturers who really partner. They do a lot of market research with distributors and in turn distributors are sharing point of sale information. This has always been a very sticky area in terms of trust, but those, those partners that figure out those kinds of relationships, they can focus on fewer brands. They can do less of trying to be all things to all customers and really focus on those high profitability, high return relationships that can just keep making the company more successful. So you're spinning your wheels less, focusing more on those customers that are really going to get you to a, a successful point without exhausting your team. And, and that to me, that's one of the big shifts over the last year um, has been those companies that have been able to quickly shift their teams to very specific um, campaigns and programs around their sales, marketing on that side, on the service side, really identifying, um, you know, the, the metrics, you know, what, what does success look like for us 90 days from now in terms of really serving our customers well? Great. Thank you. Uh, you know, the pandemic has forced a lot of selling efforts to, to go online or, or in a virtual fashion. And there's some talk in the marketplace about maybe this being a permanent reality you know some companies are looking at, at this is the the new way they'll deploy that their sales organizations is this the end of face-to-face -face selling absolutely not but i think what 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 has happened here over the last year and a half has just exposed the traditionally dysfunctional nature of what outside the sales model for a lot of distribution uh, companies have become um, I, I, I need to qualify that because uh, it steps on a lot of, of sacred cows out there. The, the, the outside sales role is absolutely critical. It's what's gotten it's what's gotten everybody to where we are today. At the same time, over the last several years, with digital Amazon business being a lot of the key reasons, um, it's really impacted the efficiency and cost structure of being able to use generalist type of sales model to go out and try to serve customers in the same way that the research I talked about that we've just completed what it really defined uh, the key takeaways was around absolutely we want face-to-face -face salespeople but we want them to be talking with us about solutions about new products the qualitative things that you can't go and find online y yeah you can go on and go to video if you need to figure out how to repair stuff it, it, and that's that's absolutely a, a chunk of information that that customers can self-serve 
What they want though, and what our research indicated is they don't want to be, they don't want their salespeople to be dealing with the transactional pieces. You know, they want to use emails to either do reorders. They want to be able to go on the, your website and find out what their status of their orders are, uh, be able to uh, really get information that's around their relationship with you and what that looks like. So it, I think what where, where, where this is going is I think every distributor really has to look at their sales model and, and figure out carefully how can we automate some things that are really slowing down our salespeople from concentrating and, and you know, their high paid employees. How can we make sure that we're using their talents and they're not going back into the, the warehouse to go pick up orders? That whole cost to serve piece is a, this is a multi-year process, but it's, it's important, I think, for every distributor to start taking a look at that. Yeah, and it's funny, the shift is somewhat pandemic inspired, but but not new, right? Like I think uh, 2018, Forrester revisited their research paper, you know, the, the death of a B2B salesperson, and, and they were talking about a lot of those same trends. So maybe the pandemic has accelerated that, like many things, but, but they, they are trends that had been uh, existing for some time now, so. All right, another question here. Uh, Amazon seems to be, be coming up a lot, and um, I think about the the, the long tail. So uh, for a distributor, small customers, or maybe uh, maybe their their add-on sales, uh, you know, smaller, high margin, um, you know, purchases, are those at, at risk to Amazon? Uh, you, you know, from a kind of a convenience buy, ease to order, um, variety pricing. Yeah, and again, I'm 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 probably going to uh, ruffle a few feathers here, but uh, you know, I, I think distributors like to bash manufacturers for selling direct on Amazon, and and I'm 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 going to defend that because I believe that manufacturers they have to be where their customers where end customers want to buy, and and if if they if they don't go there, I I think they're not serving the entire customer base. It, to me, this comes down to channel management, and, and it always has, in terms of how how manufacturers develop their relationships about how they go to market and are clearly communicate what those partnerships look like. Um, I, I think where you get into problems is where manufacturers haven't or they're not completely open with the distributors, and, and obviously that fosters no good for anybody, I, I think. So to come back specifically to your question around that, um, you know, particularly the, the the smaller high margin sales, there's two pieces really where Amazon has been successful. And I, I think in the past, it really has been that long tail of, of what people talk about, where it, it's these uh, more commodity products that's very easy and transparent. You know, you can go and it's it's very price sensitive. Um, there's another aspect out there, though, in terms of what Amazon has been developing in terms of much more going after large national accounts, institutional accounts like universities. Uh, they've made some big announcements here over the last couple of years about serving major universities, and, um, and they're also going after a lot of government business. So they're becoming more sophisticated in terms of how they're growing. So I, I think that's that's where I, I think distributors and manufacturers need to talk about what are the strategies for us to create the value propositions for our customers, particularly at those larger accounts, I think, that will really protect those relationships uh, and the value that's that's out there. Thanks. And then uh, for Ruth, yeah, there's a whole host of different topics and speakers following us. Uh, the, the next one will be in about six minutes. So I hope you enjoy your day. And then, uh, I'm sorry if I don't quite get the name right, Sam or, or Sam, um, I guess he talks about selling through distribution. So similar to Colin's question, but but he's thinking about it as a vendor. Uh, you know, they have multiple distributors, different uh, go-to-market strategies. How can a vendor standardize brand communication through distributors? 
Well, I, I think one of the real powers of distribution is that in each each market is unique, and a, and a manufacturer can't effectively serve that. Um, that that's the real power of distribution is is those frontline relationships that distributors have always built, and and you can't you can't put that online. You can't cookie cutter it as I was talking about before. Um, I really believe it's it's around building those relationships with the principals of, of those distribution companies and really not trying to create a, um, a a standardized approach for every single market. I think you're going to to hurt yourself there. You absolutely it's it's really I think around the the, the brand strength, uh, but really about the marketing support that you can give give to distributors. Um, I, I the most powerful distributor relationships I have seen have been those manufacturers who have uh, done a number of things really well. Um, often they've, they've, they have create, created very effective distributor advisory councils and invited in a lot of uh, a very uh, a powerful cross-section of their distributor partners into that. And so they have this constant feedback loop in terms of uh, you know what's happening in the market, and I mean it's just a two-way communication. So uh, I, I don't think there's a magic bullet there, but I, I think in terms of standardizing the brand communication, I, I think it's just about having clear ground rules. If if anything has shifted over the last year and a half, it's about the need to for clear communication to cut through all the noise out there that we all are dealing with, um, and and just be very clear around what your strategy is and, and why the partnership is going to be you know, one plus one equals five, because that's, that's honestly now, I think, I think both distributors and manufacturers who are very strategic right now, they are starting to pick their partners and, and treating those partners in, uh, as platinum partners, you know, however you want to define that. And I think that's, what's really what we're coming through here, that that's really forcing everybody to think about, Honestly, on a personal side as well. I mean, I think everybody's sort of reevaluating what they want to be doing and spending after we've been sort of isolated for a year plus. I think on the business side as well. I think it's forcing a lot of business leaders to say, where where are we going to be able to focus our limited resources and and relationships to make us the most successful we can be? I I think that has to be. Everybody has to start getting a little bit more. Um, I guess, defining around what that looks like. Great, thanks. Uh, we have Colin again, and, and this might this is probably going to represent our last question. Um, he's talking about uh, supply issues in, in the marketplace, and he's wondering specifically about the impact of container shortages for overseas product, and, and how will that affect uh, distributor inventory levels and, and, and possibly product costs? Yeah, so that just went way beyond my pay grade um, be, because when you when you start getting into, I mean, we we, we talk um, our our analysts talk a lot with distributors across a lot of sectors, um, and some of them like fasteners. Obviously, there's a ton of import, um, and 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 that whole uh, supply channel, and and uh, you know, we actually have uh, done a few reports recently around that. The, um, I, I mean, the bottom line impact is it's it's really around the communication and the resources. I've I've, I've seen a lot of, of um, and and this happened at the beginning of the pandemic as well when you had just this whole, um, you know, just a huge surge in demand and the shortages of PPE products and people were sourcing all over the place and it was a it was a crazy wild west in terms of you know what was out there and and the ability to really track and and source um, uh, effectively it, it, it comes back to the communication aspects I think because it's um, it, it's really the the distributors that are are successful um, are the ones that are are really upfront with their customers about potential problems and, and not coming in with any surprises. I, I don't have anything other than that. There's no magic bullet that I can see. Great, thanks, Tom. And, and that um, concludes our time. So Tom, thanks so much. Uh, it was a real pleasure sharing uh, this forum with you and, and, and having this time. So at this point, we will turn it over to the host.